sing for the freedom he has won. Even death is dead and done. His life has overcome. Speak, say the name above all names, over every broken place. He is risen from the grave. What is done? What is done? All the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. I praise God for what he's done. Now, on the throne of majesty, the Father's will complete. He reigns in victory. Oh, sing hallelujah to the King. He is worthy to receive all the worship we can bring. Yeah, what is done? What is done? All the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. I praise God for what he's done. What he's done. What he's done. All the glory and the honor to the Son. My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. I praise God for what he's done. Oh, oh, oh. I praise God for what he's done. 
Jesus, Jesus, 
on how hurts my soul. I got nothing to lose. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often do. Every song must end, and you never do. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. I've got one response. I've got just one move. With my arms stretched wide, I will worship you. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a for a heart singing hallelujah, Come on, my soul, oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song, cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs, get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul, oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord.
ask now that you would be with Mark as he presents the word. I pray that you would speak nothing more, nothing less than what you would have him to say. God, I pray that every heart in this room would be stirred in some sort of way as we pray. Good evening, everyone. How are you? Fantastic. It is so nice to be with you tonight. I'm glad that you're here. I, I want to just real quickly say a huge thank you to, our, to Chad and the worship team. Those guys have been working all weekend long. Thank you, guys. And to the, the production crew guys working in the back, that if they're not doing what they do, none of this really happens the way it happens. They do great work, and I, I appreciate you guys. Big shout out to y'all. Thank you so much for uh, sacrificing an entire weekend to listen to an old hippie who loves Jesus stand up here and talk about it. So uh, it's amazing. Nice shirt. I, you know, I appropriated this shirt on purpose. It's a true story. I didn't know about how much I was going to sweat, and I was one T-shirt short of a change of T-shirt for tonight to have a clean shirt to ride home tomorrow. So I saw T-shirts this morning. I said, I must have one. I will take it home. I will wear it. I will tell stories about you uh, all the time and be praying for you every time I see it uh, on the drawer, on my body. I'll be praying for you guys in this church. I really, really do appreciate the time and the opportunity to be here, and I, uh, I hope that you walk away maybe a little bit uh, challenged, a little bit more in love with Jesus, and, and a little more thoughtful uh, and, and encouraged to move forward on this incredible journey that we call the life of faith, right? So uh, tonight we're talking about Paul. And, and our, our text is going to be Acts chapter 9 at verse 10. It says, Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And so the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and he received his sight at once and he arose and was baptized. Would you pray with me as we get started tonight? Lord Jesus, we just thank you. I thank you again for this church, for these new friends, for brothers and sisters in Christ. I thank you for the Holy Spirit that binds us all together. And I pray now that Spirit would come and be here in a very real way. Lord, would you give us hearts to receive from you? Would you give us ears to hear, eyes to see, minds to comprehend the wonderful truth of your gospel? And help us, Lord, to move forward in our journey as we learn from you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So February 2004. Well, let me, let me back up a little bit. As we left last night, it was 1997, Jamie and I had sold our house in Dallas, Georgia, which is just northwest of Atlanta, moved off to Minneapolis, Minnesota with our family of six, four children under the age of nine. Uh, I had quit my job with Federal Express. We were going to missionary school because God had called us to do this crazy thing, and even though our parents and our friends didn't understand, we did it. Went, lived in Minneapolis for, uh, for two and a half years, left there, and I wound up pastoring a church in Jennings, Florida. Anybody know where Jennings, Florida is? I, I know you know. Right? Jennings, Florida is just across the state line. We actually would go buy our groceries in Georgia. It was closer than anything else. Uh, and so we, we lived in this place that I had never heard of, uh, pastoring this little church. Uh, we were there for about three years or so. Uh, that's where I met uh, Laddie. Uh, his mom and dad were uh, very, very dear friends of us. In fact, I would, I would venture to say that if it hadn't been for Robin and Laddie, uh, Laddie's parents, we probably would have lost our minds very early on. They were our anchor in that place, and, and we loved them. Um, but we left there and went to Thunder Bay, Ontario, which is uh, in northern Ontario. If you go to Duluth, Minnesota, and you drive along the coast of Lake Superior up to the Canadian border, go across the Canadian border, drive another 45 minutes, you will get to Thunder Bay, Ontario, which sits on Lake Superior. Uh, and to the west are the plains of Manitoba, and to the east is the Great Lake of Lake Superior. And uh, it was cold, uh, but it was great. Anyway, so now that you know, that was our, our journey, right? But in February of 2004, I woke up one morning, never forget, these things you never forget, I woke up on an air mattress in my in-law's basement in Marietta, Georgia, with all of my stuff in a storage room, and found myself once again driving a delivery truck around Atlanta. And I asked the question, what just happened? <laughs> what am I doing here? It really didn't make any sense. And here's the thing. This journey of faith that we're on is unpredictable. God is in control. We just talked about this morning. God is in control. And we, we struggle with that because God doesn't always do things the way I would do them. In fact, I will say he's a lot better at organizing my life than I am if I will trust him to do that. But I don't always like how God manages my life if I'm just being read honest. See, God requires things like self-denial and obedience. I'm not good at that. I like to be self-aware and in control. I like to do my thing. He requires patience and trust. I'm going to be honest with you. I have trust issues. I trust two people. I trust Jesus Christ and my wife. And other than that, I, I really struggle with anything else. And patience, I, I'm, uh, I'm quiet. I, I know you don't believe it. I'm actually very much of an introvert. I spend a lot of time alone being quiet. But I do that because being around people too much drives me insane. I'm not patient. I'm really not. And the journey of faith, this walk of faith, as we begin following after Jesus, because that's what he calls us to do, is walk with him. He will take us to uncomfortable places. And he will lead us into to activities that we don't want to engage in. And he will call us to do things that we feel ill-prepared for and we don't really want to do. Now, I know if I was trying to sell you something, right now you're all leaving the room going, I'm not buying it. Right? I, I, I understand that. But I, I would be lying to you if I didn't tell you the truth. And this is the truth. This walk that we are on, this journey that you, your feet were on when you received Christ as Lord and Savior, when you surrendered your life to God, and Jesus Christ entered into you and took the old man and put him to death and gave you a new spirit filled with the Spirit of God, you became his possession, not yours. And at that point, you are obligated as children of God to be servants of the king. Right? Oh, I see blank faces. Right? 
Give me, give me a head nod. I don't believe. I'm leaving. I know. Everybody's going. Look, it's challenging. And the real challenge of it is delayed gratification. Here's what Jesus tells us, right, over and over again. Jesus says, look, store up treasure in heaven. Don't store up treasure here. Don't work for things of the world. Don't pour your life into the stuff that's here. You need to be building up treasure in heaven. You know, sell everything you have. Give it all away. Get treasure in heaven. There's this promise that we have, and it's a real promise that this ain't it. Aren't you glad? I mean, really, we, we are not just animated things that are waiting to die and become worm food. We are children of God with an eternal hope in Christ. This broken, evil, wicked place that we call home is not home. We're really hanging out in a, a grubby old greyhound station, and home is about two miles past the horizon, and all we got to do is hang on, and sooner or later we're going to get there. Don't hang on to the grubby old Greyhound station. Set your eyes on home and let Jesus take you there. That's where he's leading us. That's what this journey is all about. But on the way, he wants to use us to do things through us for him. But it doesn't always look like success. It doesn't always look like fun and games. It doesn't always feel good. We have to trust him. Faith and trust go hand in hand. It's two sides of the same coin. I say I have faith, therefore I must trust him. And sometimes it's hard. But remember, Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. It's Paul who said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. These are big ideas. These are challenging ideas. This is what the journey of faith is all about. And this is what Paul is going to teach us, right? So Paul, who was Saul, Saul of Tarsus, was, was a Pharisee. Pharisees were kind of a, a pseudo-religious slash political faction in the Jewish community. They were really in charge of the temple. They were the keepers of the law. They were very, very powerful, strong men. And, and Saul of Tarsus was the up-and-coming star. Saul was there when Stephen was stoned, you know, that early martyr of the church. Saul was standing by watching the cloaks as those who were killing Stephen by hitting him with rocks when that was happening. And then, see, the church, because they were being persecuted in Jerusalem, began moving out. The, the, the new believers in Jesus began moving out of Jerusalem and so Saul goes to the council and he goes, you know, give me a warrant, basically, to go up to Damascus. And if I find any of these Jesus followers, I'm going to arrest them, bring them back to Jerusalem in chains where they can be tried, and then we can kill them with stones too. That's really the deal, what he's trying to do. And understand, Saul is not a bad guy. Saul is convinced that these early followers of Jesus are, are deluded and dangerous. He's convinced that these people have decided that this Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. He is God in the flesh. And they're worshiping him as if he was God. And Saul thinks that they are blaspheming. That is, they are speaking evil of God. They are making holy something which is unholy. And here's the facts. If Jesus was not the Son of God who rose again from the dead on the third day, Saul was absolutely correct. They're deluded and they're dangerous, and they needed to be stamped out. He's trying to stamp out what he thought was a dangerous cult, and he goes to Damascus. Now, the problem is Jesus of Nazareth was the Son of God. Actually, Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God. There's no was about it. For he was crucified. He was brutally sacrificed. He was flayed and nailed to a cross. He bled and hemorrhaged and died. And he was laid in a tomb. And on the third day, hallelujah, he rose again from the dead, right? Amen. Amen. And he's alive and well, sits at the right hand of God the Father right now. Jesus is alive. Saul didn't know that. Saul didn't believe that. Saul's on the way to Damascus. Jesus shows up. 
hey, Saul, what are you doing? Saul's like, uh, who are you? He says, well, I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Why are you fighting so hard? I've got a plan for you. And Saul is blinded by the light, and his mind is shattered by the overwhelming reality that this Jesus of Nazareth, who he thought was just another dead troublemaker, is actually the resurrected Messiah, the Christ, the living God. So he goes to Damascus blind, baffled, broken, unsure of what to do next. He's sitting in the dark, waiting for someone to come lay hands on him so he'll receive his sight. He has a vision. Ananias is going to come. So that's when God goes to Ananias and says, I need you to go. And Ananias said what? Remember the text. He goes, I know this guy. I've heard about this guy. I don't want anything to do with this guy. And I love what Jesus says. He is a chosen vessel of mine, and I am going to show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. First time I read that, I went, glad I'm not him. I didn't understand. We're all him. Because that's what the journey is. I'm going to show you. Because it's in our suffering, it's in our turmoil, it's in our tribulations, it's in the hardships that we overcome, it's in the things that we endure, that the grace and the mercy and the power of Jesus Christ is displayed to the broken world around us. If, 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 if we came to Christ and everybody just got a million dollars at the door and we went and lived fat, dumb, and happy until we went home, everybody would want to come in, but nothing would get done. Because we'd all be sitting around watching our big screen TVs. I will show him how much he must suffer. And suffer he does. And Saul receives a sight. He is immediately baptized. He becomes Paul. He becomes Paul, the, the missionary to the Gentiles. But he has a process to go through, of course. And we'll get there. Paul suffered a lot of things. He suffered physically. He had this great physical problem. It's in Acts 14... If you have your Bible, you can turn. It's 14 at verse 19. Now, what happened is Paul goes to Antioch. The, the church had moved from Jerusalem up to Antioch. They were being persecuted in Jerusalem, so there was this growing Christian community in Antioch. And from Antioch, Paul and Barnabas are sent out on the very first missionary journey. Anybody ever been on a mission trip? Anybody? Y'all are going to Guatemala, right, here in another week or so? Who, who's going? Who else going to Guatemala? Anybody? Fantastic, fantastic. It will be a life-changing experience. If you've never done it, it's a life-changing experience. But you're not the first one to do it. That belonged to Paul. Very first missionary journey. No one had ever gone out into the Greco-Roman Gentile world and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul and Barnabas go. And they would go, they would go to each town, they would go into the Jewish synagogue, and they would, you know, argue with the Jews. And then they would get frustrated, and they'd go out, and they would tell the Gentiles. The Gentiles would respond. They'd leave a church, and they'd go to the next city. And so they've moved through Iconium. They get up to, uh, to Lystra. They're in Lystra. And you can look at the map in the back of your Bible. You can see where that's at. And while they're there, first thing that happens is the people, it's, it's a temple of Zeus is there. They believe that Paul is Zeus. They come out. They're wanting to sacrifice to Paul. And you go, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute. I'm just a guy like you. But let me tell you about Jesus. Meanwhile, some Jews from Antioch and Iconium get to Lystra. They've been pursuing Paul. They get there, and this is what happens. Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of their disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Whew. Now, again, it's just a verse in our Bible. We read that. They came and they stoned Paul and assuming he was dead, drug him out and left him in the streets outside the city gate. 
Uh, Paul was stoned and left for dead. No. Paul is a real human being. He's a living, breathing person, just like Abraham, just like Jonah. They thought they killed him. They hit him with rocks until he stopped breathing. And then they drug him out and left him so the buzzards can come and feast on him. And then Barnabas and the other disciples go out and gather around. They're probably going to drag his carcass off and find a place to bury him. And somehow or another, Paul stands up. It was a miracle. But I don't think Paul just hopped up like Superman and said, Woo, that was fun. I think Paul managed to get to his feet. They managed to get him into the house, get him some water. And I think it took us some time for Paul to heal up enough to do anything. He was human. They tried to kill him. It was a physical suffering that we probably can't even begin to understand. But here's the thing. The people that came and stoned Paul thought they were doing the right thing. We look at them in the book, in the story, and we go, these evil people. No, they were convinced that Paul was deluded and dangerous, that he was now worshiping this Jesus of Nazareth, you know, that dead troublemaker, and he's saying he's God. They didn't understand what had happened. They couldn't fathom why Paul suddenly turned, because remember, he was Saul, Many biblical scholars think that he was being groomed to be the next high priest. He was on the inside of the machine. You understand, right? There's, there's, there's the temple, then there's the priesthood, and then there's the inner circle of that priesthood who controls the money, they control the power, they have all the influence, and Saul was in that group. And so when Saul turns... When Saul is converted, when Saul rejects that, he becomes the most dangerous man around because he knows way too much. He knows too much. He knows the game. He understands how it's played. And if the word gets out, it could be real trouble for the guys at the top. So they're they're after him. That's why they're chasing him from city to city, stirring people up, trying to get... But notice, they don't want to get their hands dirty. They want to get the people stirred up so that somebody else will kill them, just like they did with Jesus. And they can walk home justified. Got rid of the problem. They thought they got rid of the problem. God had other plans. See, the establishment didn't get it. And Paul was not able to walk away from his old life without consequences. Paul was not able to walk away from his old life without consequences. And my friends, I'm telling you, and many of you will know it, I promise you, I'll stand around, I would love to hear your stories, how when you got saved, the people around you did not understand what happened. They didn't get it, you know? When we become followers of Jesus, our relationship with the world changes. We're no longer of the world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We become new creations. We become something else. And those friends that you've had that you thought were your friends, you know, since high school, they don't understand why you're not doing the things that you were doing in high school. They don't understand why things have changed, why your relationship has changed, why you're talking about this Jesus all the time. Would you just shut up? Have you been there? You're being alienated. Sometimes it's even your own family, you know? Sometimes it's your neighbor. Sometimes it's your employer. Now, they might not throw rocks at you, but they'll wound you. Have you been wounded by people who you thought were your friends that turned out? They weren't. Or they were your friends until you changed. That is a real consequence of the journey. But here's the thing. When that happens, what do we do? But we have to keep the kingdom perspective. Remember what we learned from Jonah. We have to see through the lens. We have to understand they're not bad people. They're lost people. Lost people do lost people stuff. Saved people shouldn't do as much lost people stuff as we do, probably, but, you know, you get it. Paul, Paul couldn't walk away unscathed, and neither will we. 
There's a consequence to this thing called salvation. There's a consequence to this thing called transformation. There's a consequence to this thing called new life and Jesus and, and a walk of faith. And the consequence is that the world is turned from us and we're no longer living here. We're no longer citizens of the world. We're pilgrims and sojourners. We're on a path. We're going somewhere else. This isn't our home. But we have to understand that we have to love the people who now hate us, and we have to be willing, like Abraham, to keep going. Even when it hurts, even when we're rejected, even when things are frustrating, even when it's uncomfortable. We press on, and we keep risking it. We must risk love. We have to be willing to love until it hurts. Because if we don't, how will they know that we're for real? Paul loved until it hurt, and he kept loving. There's a physical cost, but there's also an emotional cost. And I think it's, that's probably the hardest one is the emotional cost. If we, if we look forward to Acts 15, verse 36, Paul and Barnabas get back to Antioch. And this says, then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back to visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Again, you read this little passage, Paul and Barnabas, they fall out. And here's what we don't really understand. Who was Barnabas in Paul's life? See, when Saul is converted and becomes Paul, he wants to go and meet with Peter and James and John, the disciples in Jerusalem. And they don't want anything to do with him. I wonder why. They don't want anything to do with him. But Barnabas, Barnabas, who was one of the early disciples in the church, one of the early followers of Jesus, goes to the disciples and vouches for Paul. He is his advocate for them. He gets Paul in to see Peter and James and John and talk with them. It's Barnabas who opens the door. Without Barnabas, there is no Paul because he never gets the approval of Peter and the other disciples to go and share the gospel. He gets his validation because of Barnabas. Barnabas is his friend. He recognized his transformation, and he gets him in. Barnabas is the one chosen by God to be Paul's companion on the first ship. It's in Acts 13. You can see it. They take the gospel into the Gentile world for the first time. They suffered together. They saw incredible miracles together. They, they lived life together in a way that very few people could ever even understand. Right? They suffered together. They experienced miracles. They saw wondrous works of the Spirit. They saw people get saved. They saw people healed. They saw demon-possessed people freed. They saw all of these things happen as they went out in the labor of God together, taking the gospel out. We think about Paul being the great missionary. He's nothing. He's got Barnabas with him. It's Paul and Barnabas who are going and doing all of these things. They're like brothers forged together in this great work of God. And they go. They labored in the kingdom. They're faithful. And then Paul has a great idea. They get back, they rest up, and they say, let's go, let's go see everybody again, encourage everybody. Now, if you go back and look at the story, when they went on the first trip, they took John Mark with them. He was a young guy. And he gets to Pamphylia, they, they get about two stops in, and he goes, you know what, I don't think this is for me. And he turns around and goes home. Now, when they get ready to go again, Barnabas says, yeah, we gotta take, we gotta take John Mark with us. And Paul says, no. I'm not taking that kid. He bailed on us last time. I'm not dealing with that. We don't have time for him. We got serious work to do here. He's weak. He's not committed. I'm not doing it. And Barnabas says to Paul, but wait a minute, Paul. 
Doesn't he deserve a second chance? Just like you got a second chance. And Barnabas becomes the advocate for John Mark, just like he was the advocate for Paul. He says, no, we, we got to take the kid. The kid needs to go. He wants to go. Let's take him. Paul says, absolutely not. I'm not going anywhere with that kid. And it says that the argument grew so fierce, the contention was so fierce that they parted ways. They parted ways. Wow. These men who had seen all of this incredible stuff, these guys who had an experience that nobody else had ever had taking the gospel out into the Gentile world for the first time, these men who were forged in the fire fall out over the kid because Paul is not going to take him. And that was the end of their relationship. Well, actually, it wasn't. If you go forward... You see that Paul does mention Barnabas a couple of times in his letters. So we assume there was some reconciliation along the way. The Barnabas and, and John Mark head off to Cyprus, and, and in Acts, that's the end, we, that we never see them again. They went on their journey. Paul continues on his. Now, we know, we know Mark becomes a helpful assistant to Paul because I think he's in Romans where Paul says, hey, send John Mark to me. He is useful for my ministry. He's in prison. He needs John Mark to come. We know that this guy named John Mark, well, he goes on to write the Gospel of Mark, which is probably the first of the Gospels that was written, kind of an important book in the Bible. You know, turns out the kid was called by God to do some pretty important stuff. And so it's hard to say Barnabas was wrong. I think Paul was the bonehead in this one, right? Or maybe, maybe God just intended two missionary trips to go out. I don't know. He's God. All I know is there was a morning that Paul woke up and Barnabas was not there. And can you imagine what an empty feeling that had to be after all that they had been through for them to wake up one day and that partnership was split. That is a real cost. I'll tell you this. I've been, I've been on this journey for 30 years. 30 years, 93 to 212, just 23, right? That'll be 30 years. I'm not good at math. I don't have enough toes. <laughs> Along the way, the hardest things that I have lost have been relationships. And I've lost a lot of relationships along the way. Lost relationships with friends, with churches, even with family members along the way, people I was very close to. And, and usually, you know, it, it's not like Paul and Barnabas. You know, we don't have a fight and fall out. Usually, our paths just divert along the way. We, we travel together for a while, and then we go the other way. You know, I went to missionary school. We were at school with, with people from all over the world. I mean, I think there were, there were students from every continent in the school when I was there who came with all these different backgrounds, people that I, I studied with and I prayed with and I worshiped with and I talked with and I loved. And then as we graduated, we all went our separate ways. And I, I have several people that, that, you know, we hugged and said, I'll see you in heaven because I knew I'd never see them again. Till we get home. Till we get home. It's hard. Sometimes it happens slowly. Sometimes you go away on your trip, on your journey, and then you converge back to some place and you find out that the people that you left behind have been on a different journey. And people that were your very close friends, you just don't click anymore. It's not that they're not Christians, it's just that. You're just not the same. I have people like that. We lose things along the way. And there are other times, like with Paul and Barnabas, that this separation happens very suddenly and unexpectedly. I mean, you can't count on it. It just happens. And, and that's what happened in Thunder Bay. So I was in, we got to Thunder Bay, 
First Baptist Church of Thunder Bay. I was the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Thunder Bay, Ontario, of the Baptist Convention of Ontario and Quebec. It wasn't a Southern Baptist Church. It was a Northern Ontario Baptist Church. Uh, and, and we didn't know. What we didn't, weren't told, you know, things the search committee won't tell you is they just went through a horrible split and nobody in Thunder Bay would touch them. And so they went deep into the pile of resumes and called me from, you know, South Florida and come all the way to Thunder Bay. Because I was dumb. And, uh, but we got there, and, and I loved it. We loved Thunder Bay. I mean, yes, it was 50 below zero with a wind chill of minus 70 for about a week one time. And that was hard. But the people were great. Once I kind of ran off a couple of people from the church, it was fantastic. <laughs> That's true. I'm, I'm not lying. That's kind of what happened. In October of 2003, we'd been there about a year. In, in October, we put on a missions conference like they had never had before. We had missionaries and missions organizations from all over North America who came to Thunder Bay, and we met. We had a fantastic weekend missions conference. Everybody in the church was riding high. It's the most successful job I have ever had in my life. I have never felt better about work. I have never felt like I had accomplished more in a short period of time. Things were unified. I had a, a college and careers Bible study that was, I mean, I had like 50 kids coming. People were coming in from the community. The church was growing. Everything was going great. And then we came home for Christmas. When we got home for Christmas, Jamie's mom was, was not doing well. Um, she had really declined since the last time we had seen her. And we got back after Christmas, first of the year, and, and we began praying and said, what, what are we going to do? So we, we need to go home. Now, I told Jamie, I said, well, should we go in January? I kind of felt, I mean, I thought God said, you know, you're going to go home. You're, you're moving back in January. I said, Jamie, let's go home in January. She goes, are you crazy? Nobody leaves Canada in January. The snow's seven feet deep. It's, you know, minus 40 outside. That's a dumb idea. And those kids are in school. Let's wait till spring. We'll go home. I said, okay. But I went and sat down with one of my elders at the church, and I said, and I told him what was going on. I said, you know, we're going to have to leave and go home and take care of, of my mother-in-law. She's not doing well. We need to be there. And he looked at me, and he goes, well, you need to go now. So it's January. He said, I know. You need to go home. This is the best job I ever had. This was the most success I had ever experienced in my life. This was a place I loved. I loved the people. I loved the town. I loved the, everything about it. I loved it. I didn't want to leave Thunder Bay. But we needed to leave. And so with a really heavy heart, we, I packed a U-Haul with snow blowing down my back in minus 20 weather, and we, we moved back. I had no money. I, I managed to get a job with a, with a trucking company delivering candy around Atlanta. And we were literally living in the bonus room in the basement, sleeping on an air mattress while we were looking for a house and trying to figure things out. God was good. We got into our house. We moved into our house in April. But I, I wasn't really talking to God right then because I was pretty mad at him because he had taken away from me the best job I ever had. I loved it. I didn't want to go. The people didn't want me to go. And it, it hurt. I, I, even had, I even had one woman come up to me as I was the, the last day after I preached my last message. I was cleaning out my office. And she came up. She goes, you know, you are in sin. You're in sin. You are rejecting the calling of God. You're supposed to stay here. And I just looked at her and I said, I don't want to go, but I have to. It's what I have to do. We got home. We managed to get into our house. I got the job. We got a house. Needed a lot of work, but we got into it. I own it now. And um, we got to April. Finally got moved in. And uh, and Doris just continued to decline. And she ended up in the hospital. 
in Marietta. I was working in Kennesaw, Georgia, and you don't have any idea where this geography is. But anyway, I, I worked here, I lived here, the hospital was here. Does that make sense? And Doris was in the hospital, and she was failing. And, and there was actually a moment that the doctors took Jamie and her sister out and said, look, your mother's dying, and we don't know why. And all the time, I'm dr driving around in a delivery truck, mad at God. One afternoon, I got back from my run. I was leaving work, tired. And the Lord just spoke to me. He says, you need to go see Doris in the hospital. I said, go away and leave me alone. I don't want to talk to you right now. But he wouldn't leave me alone. He said, no, Mark, I need you to go talk to Doris in the hospital. I said, okay. Now, we were so broke, we couldn't afford the parking deck at the hospital. So we, there was a park about three blocks away down a hill, and we'd go park in the park and climb this hill to get up to the hospital to go in. So I'd go park in the park, go in the wrong direction. I'm just huffing up the hill, storm into the hospital, get up to the room, walk in, and it's dark. I'll never forget. It was dark. The only light on was the little light on the back of the bed. Windows were Curtains were drawn. The room was dark. She was asleep. And I walked into the room, and I said, um, I said, hi, Doris. And she opened her eyes, and she reached out, and she grabbed hold of me like a frightened child. And she said to me, Mark, can you help me find peace with God? I said, well, Doris, I, I think I can do that. And I sat down at her bedside, and I explained the gospel simply. And I said, all right, Doris, you know, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? She said, yeah, I believe that. I said, do you believe that he, he died on a cross for your sins and mine, that he rose again on the third day, and he's alive and well today? She goes, I believe it. I said, Doris, are you ready right now? Would you surrender your life to Christ? Would you, would you give yourself to him and trust him for eternity? She says, yes, I want to do that. I want to do that. And so in that room, I sat and I held her hand, and we prayed. And my mother-in-law got saved. Three days later, she slipped into a coma. A week later, she was dead. And here's my question. Would God move a family of six, 1,200 miles, of a Canadian winter, so that the one person who could answer the question that one person needed an answer for on their deathbed would be there at that moment? And the answer is yes. It was the best job I ever had, y'all. I loved it. I lost a lot when I lost it. Emotionally, as a man, it hurt. But was it worth it? It was absolutely worth it. I would say I would give it all up right now for the same thing. I never look back because this is what I know. I know there's going to come a day when I'm going to step over into my home and Doris is going to be standing there with her arms out saying, thank you for being there. I know that. As sure as I know, I'm standing in Bainbridge, Georgia right now. This walk of faith, it's not easy. And I know this is a heavy way to kind of end this evening and this weekend. I know everybody's going, I don't know. But I'm telling you, is it worth it? Yes, it's worth every step. Ask Abraham, was it worth it? Yes, it was worth every step. Ask Paul, he will tell you, yes, it was worth the stonings. It was worth the beatings. It was worth the imprisonment. It was worth having his head chopped off in Rome. It was all worth it because Jesus Christ is worth it. The kingdom of God is worth it. He wants you to follow him on a journey of a lifetime 
being obedient to the things that he calls you to do. My journey is not your journey. I'm just telling you. He wants to use you just as much as he will use me or anyone else to share this incredible message with as many people as we can. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He died on a cross. He rose on the third day. He's alive and well. He's coming back, and he wants to transform your broken life and redeem you and use you in ways you can never imagine. That is the gospel. That's the good news. And we are on this thing together. See, I've, I've done you a disservice. I've come in for three messages. I have now charged you to take the journey and take it seriously. It doesn't mean we can't have some fun along the way. It doesn't mean you won't make great friends. It won't mean that you won't have joys along the way. You will be blessed along the way, but you're going to be challenged. Don't give up. <sighs> Paul puts it this way in Philippians 3. He said, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Count it all gain. Everything I have lost is gain. Every bit of suffering had purpose. Every trial has a reason. Every obedient act resonates in the kingdom of God far beyond anything we can understand. He's calling you. He's calling you to follow him. And my question, my final question, will you listen? Will you follow? Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for this opportunity. I thank you so much for this church. Thank you for Laddie, for, for his willingness to, to let me come, to share these messages in my heart with these wonderful people. Thank you for the connection that we have. Pray for the future that we may continue to encourage one another as we journey towards home. I pray for Bainbridge Church I pray that you will turn this place and continue to transform this place into a shining light, that it will beam out into the darkness, this community, that would draw all men to you. Lord Jesus, you said that if you be high and lifted up, you will draw all men to yourself. Lord, I thank you that this is a place that celebrates Jesus Christ, that is focused not on success in a worldly sense, but on growing deeper, stronger relationships with you through your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come and rest with your people. And as we go from this place tonight, Lord, I pray, I pray that you will be speaking to the hearts of those who have been on this journey with me this weekend, and that they will be encouraged to keep going, to endure and to be transformed even more into the likeness of Christ as we struggle, as we overcome, and as we experience an intimate relationship that only comes by being fully surrendered, completely dependent, and walking in trust and faith in you. I love you, Jesus. I love these people. And we pray all of this in your precious name. Amen. I did promise you that I would throw open the floor to questions or comments if anyone has a question or comment.
Anyone? No? Well, I'll be hanging out, so if something comes up, please come and talk to me. I'll, I'll be here until Laddie drags me out. Oh, the light came on. <laughs> and, uh, and I would love to talk to you. And really, again, it has been a joy to be here. I love you guys, and uh, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for, uh, for listening. Have a great night. Laddie? Yeah.